So I've been reading this book called The Moral Animal by Robert Wright, and it is a book that tries to explain evolutionary psychology. I think the goal was to apply it to morality, but the book has so far ignored morality for the most part. But as I was reading this book, I was reminded of the fact that there's a lot of people who don't understand what evolutionary psychology is, and I think it's worthwhile to talk about it. Someone on Instagram had sent me a video of another YouTuber who was talking about evolutionary psychology, calling it a pseudoscience. I don't think that's a fair characterization, and I don't think the person who made the video actually understands evolutionary psychology. So what exactly is evolutionary psychology? When we consider ordinary evolution, it's the idea that there are traits that get passed down through generations of an organism, okay? And at the level of selection that we're talking about is the gene level, that the genes pass down traits that if they happen to be successful in the environment they find themselves in, then they continue to pass off more copies of their own gene. Evolutionary psychology takes that idea and applies it to mental traits. It says that the idea of traits being passed down doesn't simply stop at the level of hands or necks or torsos or muscles. It also uh, continues to the level of mental organization or psychology, the way your mind is organized. And so that's what evolutionary psychology is in its simplest form, its most core elements. And you have to keep in mind that gene selectionism isn't this idea that it is going to fit towards a specific environment. It is not some conscious thing. It is simply a bunch of genes working together to produce a trait. And if that trait works, then the genes get passed on. It is that simple. It is no more complex than that. And you have to be very careful not to straw man and misrepresent that very, very nuanced take. Now, there are some questions and a lot of misunderstandings that come as a result of taking that worldview, and we're going to explore those. So the first question I think we should deal with is whether evolutionary psychology is a pseudoscience or not. And the answer to this will ultimately depend on your methodology or philosophy of science. I wrote a book about epistemology and about methods of knowledge, and I, from my experience, I found that none of them are epistemically certain. They're all equally unjustified. And so when you think of a pseudoscience, like I think the definition of it is it doesn't follow scientific methods. And I think Popper had his own definition of it as well. But people vary in their definition of what is a scientific method. And so you could say a lot of things are pseudosciences, uh, depending on your axioms. From my understanding of this, though, no theory or method of going about doing science has ever been demonstrated to be epistemically certain. And so I don't think it's useful to ask whether something is a pseudoscience or not. I think it's useful to ask whether something can produce meaningful predictions or not. To which I would say, yes, evolutionary psychology not only helps you provide meaningful predictions, but it also helps you understand human psychology from another framework or another lens of analysis, which can be quite useful. Related to that question is, uh, what are these just-so stories? A lot of the times you will hear when you read about evolutionary psychology this critique that they are just-so stories, and because they are just-so stories, and you could probably also say that they are, it's a pseudoscience. Now, what is this just-so story? The idea behind a just-so story is that you can look at reality, describe something, and, since, and then from describing reality, conclude that your theory is correct. So you can go and say, oh, well, there's a set of behaviors I don't understand. I can describe those set of behaviors, and then you can fit it into the axioms of evolutionary theory. One common example might be if you have non-biological parents raising a child who is uh, adopted, or maybe they got into a relationship where it wasn't their child, and you find that they're more likely to abuse that child, well, then evolutionary theorists will come in and say, well, that's because they have a low level of relatedness, they don't share the same genes, and so the non-biological parent doesn't care about the, the child because it's not their genes, and so they're more likely to abuse them. That would be an example of a just-so story, and therefore your theory is true because it explains the, the uh, reality at hand. It's kind of like putting the cart before the horse. Now, that is, in some sense, a good critique, but at the same time, that just-so story can then be used to make predictions and therefore engage in falsif falsification if you accept that as your standard of evidence. I don't have an issue with the just-so story. Again, you can make any explanations you want. My version of science, or like the way I consider science useful, is whether or not you can make predictions. And from the just-so story, you can in fact make predictions, so I don't view it as a critique. Now, those are some of the critiques of evolutionary psychology's methodology. Uh, we can now look at some of the common misconceptions, because 
some of the common misconceptions can also be used as critiques, but also the religious outright misconceptions. So I think they should be kept separate. Now, the first one is going to be a kind of actually these, these four terms, okay? Adaptive, adaptation, fitness maximization, and adaptation executioner. So there's a lot of confusion about the difference between something being adaptive versus something being an adaptation. There are behaviors that can be adaptive, but that is not what evolution is selecting for. Evolution is selecting for what are called adaptations. Adaptations being things like uh, mental traits, uh, your hand could be like an adaptation. Whereas something like, for example, using social media can be adaptive. If we find that people who use social media have more offspring, then that could be uh, argued to be adaptive, but that is not what we would argue evolution is selected for. We would say that evolution is selected for the, the default neural network in your brain that is responsible for social hierarchies, like social semantics, uh, having a bias towards social organization. That would be the adaptation that leads to an adaptive behavior, but the adaptation is what is being selected for, not the what is adaptive, not you using Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. <laughs> the next thing is fitness maximization versus adaptation execution, which is slightly related. The idea is that genes go for fitness maximization versus genes execute adaptations. Some sociobiologists would argue that genes select for fitness maximization and that they change more, like the, the, the level of, the time span for evolution is much smaller. So we can, for example, say, gathering around a fire was fitness maximizing behavior and so evolution selected for that. Some sociobiologists would indeed argue that Whereas an evolutionary psychologist would argue that evolution is like an adaptation executioner or like uh, gene selection is like adaptation executioner in the sense that it looks for an adaptation, executes that adaptation because it simply worked. Sometimes that adaptation engages in behavior B, sometimes it engages in behavior C, or sometimes even behavior D, okay? But we don't care the adaptation seems to be, seems to be working we don't care how it's executed in the environment. That's how evolutionary psychology looks at things. Another common misconception is this idea of fitness. People do not understand what fitness means unless they've studied biology. So some people will take fitness when they say like survival of the fittest to mean like the strongest, the smartest, the wealthiest. This is not what fitness means. Sometimes it can mean that, but not always. Evolution is very, very complex and sometimes Fitness can correlate to things like someone who's weaker in some cases or someone who's more cooperative rather than aggressive. It's basically whatever trait passes down more copies of its uh, gene or more copies of its offspring will be a fitter trait. So whoever passes on more genes is fitter. It's not whoever is smarter is fitter, whoever is stronger is fitter. It's fitness, it's not used in the ordinary sense that we would use it, it's used in the sense that whatever passes on more genes. So when people say survival of the fittest, uh, this is a misunderstanding when they apply it to things like whoever's wealthier should benefit more, whoever's smarter, so on and so forth, which leads to social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is another perfect example of using Darwinian thinking to justify bad policies. So we should uh, ignore the people who are not smart, favor the people who are smart, uh, not make policies that harm the wealthy and the people who are the fittest and basically just let the people who are not the fittest uh, just ignore them. That's kind of, I don't know if that's like a steel man of Darwinian think, so, social Darwinism. I wouldn't know how to steel man social Darwinism that well. Um, basically ignore the those who aren't fit and <laughs> pay attention to those who are fit, okay? The point being Hey, so the social Darwinism is just elitism. That's all it is. It has nothing more than that. It's not science. It's just elitism and it's old plain and fashion form with another word. Another really, really big misunderstanding as well is the way that traits have worked. So with, think about genetic determinism, cultural determinism, and like theories of human nature. People who say that it's completely blank slate it's probably not correct. People who say it's completely genetically determined, uh, this is, it's a bit, of, it's a bit, <laughs> it's a strange thing to say because we know that genes are flexible. And so when people say genetic determinism, 
people mean to say that you're not, there is a human nature that is unable to change, but we know that genes are flexible, and so it's not what people ordinarily mean by genetic determinism. Uh, the idea here is that if you look at most traits in humans, even the ones that are universal, such as like family organization, uh, languages, uh, cognition styles, these are actually flexible, and there is good reason, there is good evolutionary logic as to why traits should be flexible. And some people have actually tried to develop uh, developmental frameworks, like evolutionary psychology developmental frameworks, uh, for looking at traits, especially when you're younger, that can be um, present, maybe in the like, first four, three or four years of your life, but if you're put in a certain environment, are then changed and adapted to the environment. Uh, again, going back to this idea that here is a trait you get, and sometimes it's executed in style A, style B, or style C. It's not executed the same way uh, in every single circumstance. So think of something like language. If you grow up in Canada, you might speak English. If you grow up in China, you might speak Mandarin. If you grow up in France, you will speak French. You're all using the same neural structures to engage in those languages, but the way they've been executed in the environment has been changed. So the evolutionary logic here is that flexibility is really good. Evolution doesn't have this foresight. It is not this conscious thing that is looking into the environment and making you evolve for the specific environment. It is basically giving you a trait that tends to work in the environment you are found in. So it needs flexibility. It, it makes sense for it to have some flexibility inside its actual uh, expression. Therefore, it's not, when you say genetic determinism, it's not that you can't change. I feel like this is another common misconception that is applied to evolutionary psychology. And I'll talk about it later in the fear section, uh, but that is not it is not what uh, evolutionary psychology argues. Genetic determinism doesn't mean there is no level of change, and evolutionary psychology also doesn't even argue for genetic determinism. So I want to talk now about some common fears that come from evolutionary psychology, or that people have about evolutionary psychology. One is inequality. Uh, these are all fears, by the way, coming from Steven Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, which I think is a terrific book to understand evolutionary psychology. Uh, but the, one of them is inequality, and Pinker breaks it down by saying that there is one prejudice. So if we find that there are genetic differences between people, uh, races, and classes, uh, that this will lead to prejudice. Uh, he also says that if there is, we find, again, genetic differences between races, people, and classes, that this might justify social Darwinism, that uh, the reason why people who are on the top is not because of environmental advantages that they've been given, and it's because of genetic advantages, and we can't help the people on the bottom because they don't have these genetic advantages. So this would be social Darwinism. And then another one would be eugenics, that uh, there are some people who shouldn't be breeding because they don't have the right uh, genetic equipment to be breeding, or their genes aren't worthy of breeding. And so we should stop them from having babies, so on and so forth. Uh, these are kind of, kind of common fears that arise with evolutionary psychology. I would agree with Pinker that they are not good fears because inequalities or differences shouldn't negate our values or our beliefs about ethics. I don't think that evolution is a source of ethics. If there are differences between people, it doesn't mean we should go and treat them horribly. I don't think anybody would, would argue that. I don't think anybody, any evolutionary psychologist would even argue that. I don't think I've ever seen that written in evolutionary psychology. And so this one fear, even if it exists, it shouldn't be a way to uh, basically negate a field of investigation. Even if we did find that there were differences between people, we shouldn't negate a field of investigation. We should have some confidence in the ethics and standards we've developed as a society. <laughs> Another fear that Pinker pointed out was imperfectibility, which it's again, it really hits the, hits the spot. On the one hand, it's the idea that you can't engage in reforms. So if there are really, really horrid things going on in society, let's say like slavery, and you find that this is like a natural state of man, then the idea here is that you can't use government policy to reform society. Now, we know this is not true. We've had tons of government policies that have reformed society. And so I think that fear is not warranted. And in addition to this, there are tons of government policies that are based off the blank slate theory that have actually led to tons of atrocities. It, there is a happy medium there where you have to recognize there is human nature, but that nature is malleable. 
okay? The other thing would be what is natural is good. A lot of people are afraid that if we accept that there's human nature, then what is natural is good. It's, you can't fix this. So, for example, theft, you can't get rid of theft in your society, or uh, rape, or murder, or pillaging, or violence in general. You can't get rid of these things because they're natural. Again, this is not true. Human nature is malleable. The last two fears are very similar, and it's the fear of nihilism and the fear of determinism. So the fear of nihilism is the idea that, well, everything is genetically determined. Uh, I basically programmed to do one thing over another. Why should I try and make any meaningful choices in my life? Because none of it has any meaning. Same thing holds true for like the fear of determinism. The idea that people are genetically determined, they can't change for the better in their life, they can't improve their, their circumstances, they're doomed to always be poor because they just don't have a genetic advantage. These are all uh, fears that are blown out of proportion. Going back again to what I said earlier, human nature is malleable. You are, if you were born poor, you're not genetically determined to be poor, or even... I'd actually argue you're more environmentally determined to be poor than genetically determined to be poor because um, the environment tends to be harder to change in my experience at least that's how this is not scientific I'm just in my own opinion it's always been harder to change an environment than to change yourself so if anything you should be afraid of cultural determinism not genetic determinism but at any rate the fear of nihilism and the fear of determinism these are just fears that are blown out of proportion even like the one of nihilism this holds true for pretty much uh, any any uh, scientific theorizing, anytime you apply naturalism to anything, uh, people will become nihilists about this. That's up to them. I've always been of the belief that you make your own meaning in life. But anyways, those are some of the common fears of evolutionary psychology, and a lot of them are just not justified or warranted. I don't think you need to pay too much attention to them. So what do we have here? We have a field of psychology, just like Freudian psychology, that provides us with another way of viewing social science data. Uh, some people say we shouldn't do evolutionary psychology because the impacts can be really, really bad inside society, but there are no shortages of non-evolutionary psychology done in the social sciences that have, that have already had terrible impacts on, on society. Uh, Evolutionary psychology just provides another fundamental framework for viewing humans, right? It puts us in the context of evolution, and Freudian psychology also does this too. It provides us with another framework to view humans. Freudian psychology might say like the what the, the ego, the superego, and the id, and he applies like a little a sexual spin on everything. Whereas uh, Darwinian psychology, you could have sexual selection and natural selection. Uh, you can have divergent and convergent evolution to look at how humans are formed. They're just frameworks, okay? Uh, they're not guaranteed uh, truths. They're just frameworks used to explain various sets of perceptions. So with that being said, guys, I hope that helps you understand evolutionary psychology. I really view the book, Robert Wright's The Moral Animal, and you guys will be able to see some more experiments and some more studies on this stuff that are kind of interesting. But hopefully this helps clarify any misconceptions you have about evolutionary psychology. Bye-bye.